thanks everybody for um, coming to this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm Mary Rieger. I'm a third year female pelvic medicine and constructive surgery fellow. Uh, I spent my training time between Kaiser Permanente here in San Diego and UCSD. And today I'm going to present my thesis project entitled Gentamicin Travesical Efficacy for Infection of Urinary Tract, or GIVE IT for short. And this is a clinical trial that's been approved by the IRBs of both Kaiser and UCSD. And additionally, it's been registered with clinicaltrials.gov prior to any recruitment and has been approved by the FDA under an IND protocol. of this project is that despite universal administration of prophylactic intravenous antibiotics before urogynecologic surgery, that is surgery for the pelvic organ prolapse or pelvic organ prolapse or urinary incontinence, urinary tract infections occur postoperatively in up to 35% of women. A frequent postoperative UTI is probably due to necessary intraoperative urinary tract instrumentation, such as bladder catheterization and cystoscopy, which is placing a camera through the the urethra into the bladder to ensure no urinary tract injury during surgery, as well as transient postoperative voiding dysfunction, which is common. Data from several randomized trials conflicts regarding the efficacy of postoperative prophylactic oral antibiotics for UTI prevention. What's more, Oral antibiotics can cause systemic adverse effects beyond the body site they are intended to treat and rely on patient compliance. Intravescal administration of gentamicin, that is, installation of gentamicin sulfate solution directly into the bladder through a catheter has been used to safely treat UTI for years and is not absorbed systemically, meaning it's not absorbed into the body from the bladder. Um, uh, so the potential for systemic adverse effects at other body sites is limited. My research question is, will a one-time, immediately postoperative intravesical installation of gentamicin decrease the proportion of women who are treated with antibiotics for UTI symptoms within six weeks after urogynecologic surgery compared with a sham installation? And I'll explain in more detail what the sham installation entails in a moment. My hypothesis is that the gentamicin installation will decrease the proportion of women who are treated with antibiotics for UTI symptoms within six weeks after urogynecologic surgery compared with sham installation. For my sample size calculation, I assumed a baseline postoperative UTI rate of 17% in my sham arm. This is based on my chart review of the postoperative UTI rate in patients from Kaiser San Diego over a two-month period of time who would have been eligible for my study. None of these patients received postoperative prophylactic antibiotics per Kaiser's standard of care. I determined that 166 participants would be needed per arm, or 332 total, would be needed to show a reduction to 80% in the gentamicin arm. This difference is based on expert opinion from my mentors, although a meaningful reduction would be to impact the clinical practice. My study design is a randomized participant-masked clinical trial at two study sites, Kaiser Permanente San Diego and UCSD. The study population is English or Spanish-speaking women planning to undergo urogynecologic surgery for pelvic organ prolapse or urinary incontinence at these uh, two sites. There are two study arms, the gentamicin arm and the sham arm. For participants randomized to the gentamicin arm, at the end of the procedure, while still under anesthesia, the participant will receive a one-time installation of 80 milligrams gentamicin sulfate mixed with 50 mLs of normal saline, which is then retained in the bladder for one hour by clamping the catheter uh, and then releasing it in the PACU. After that, um, the catheter is allowed to drain normally. Participants randomized to the sham arm. At the end of the procedure, while still under anesthesia, the participant simply has their catheter clamped for one hour without anything being instilled into the bladder. I'm referring to the control arm as the sham arm because I think that's uh, probably more accurately reflects the nature of the control since I'm not um, actually administering a placebo. Therefore, I wasn't calling it a placebo-controlled trial. 
The randomization is stratified on the trial site and the types of prolapse surgery and whether incontinence surgery was also done as different types of prolapse surgery and incontinence procedures have different baseline postoperative UTI rates. My primary outcome for this study is the proportion of participants in each arm treated with antibiotics for UTI surgery. And fortunately, I can't analyze or present uh, primary outcome analysis at this point because I haven't finished recruitment, um, which is actually largely due to uh, surgery scheduling restrictions because of the pandemic. And I didn't plan for an interim primary outcome analysis uh, because of the bias I could introduce. Um, so for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to assess whether my randomization has worked so far. That is to say, I'm testing the hypothesis that there are not baseline or perioperative characteristic differences between my two study arms. And I'm also assessing secondary outcomes of risk factors for UTI treatment after gynecologic surgery. So looking at risk factors for my primary outcome aside from the study arm. And I hypothesize that increased number of bladder instrumentations with cystoscopy or catheterization would be associated with increased UTI. Finally, I'm assessing for um, risk factors for participants failing their discharge voiding trial. That is that they're unable to void in the recovery area after surgery and needed to go home with a temporary bladder catheter. And in this case, I hypothesize that undergoing a suburethral sling would be predictive of failing the voiding trial. For my data analysis, I used SPSS. I started by comparing baseline uh, and perioperative characteristics between study arms. So for the binary variables, I used Fisher's exact test. For continuous variables, I used independent samples t-test. For ordinal variables, I used the Man Whitney u-test. And for um, nominal variables with more than two values at uh, two um, different um, categories, I used the chi-square test. And in all cases, a p-value of less than 0.05 was considered statistically significant. And to build my logistic regression model, I first performed univariate analyses for all the variables um, that I collected data on to, um, that I'm presenting on here to determine potential significant predictors. And I used a backward model selection for my models with a cutoff of P less than 0.1 for model inclusion. And then in the final models, the predictors were considered significant if the confidence interval for the odds ratio didn't cross one. Um, so this table shows the results of my analysis of the baseline patient characteristics between these two study arms. So far, 93 participants in the sham arm and 100 participants in the gentamicin arm have been randomized and completed the six-week follow-up. No one's dropped out before the six-week mark. And as you can see here, there's no significant differences between the two study arms for all of the baseline characteristic data I collected. Um, the data I collected included many different things, including participant age at time of surgery and race ethnicity as listed in the medical record, and I also collected data regarding body mass index, parity, meaning number of times, number of uh, times participant is given birth, the American Society for Anesthesiologists physical status class, which is a um, kind of a classification of overall health that the anesthesia team uses. Other data included whether a participant had a hysterectomy, diabetes mellitus type 1 or 2, current smoking, postmenopausal status, vaginal estrogen use, systemic hormone replacement therapy, um, number of uropathogen, number of participants who had a uropathogen on their preoperative urine culture, which is something we always assess for, and percentage of uh, participants in each arm who are from each study site. So you can see roughly two-thirds of the patients uh, have been from Kaiser, which is a higher surgical volume, and roughly one-third here at UC San Diego. This table is uh, showing a comparison of perioperative characteristics between study arms, and here you can see the randomization has also been working in that no perioperative characteristics were different between the study arms, no difference in proportion, uh, um, no difference in antibiotic regimen uh, given preoperatively um, for surgical site infection between groups, no difference in um, type of prolapse repair or performance of a suburethral sling, no dis difference in number of cystoscopies or catheterizations, estimated blood loss, operative time, hospital length of stay, rate of failing the voiding trial, or being treated with antibiotics for a non-UTI reason postoperatively. And overall, um, so far, I found that there's an 8.8 8% um, uh, rate of the primary outcome of treatment empirically for urinary symptoms at six weeks. Um, but like I told you, I can't tell you um, the specific breakdown between the groups uh, until I have completed my enrollment. 
So this, these tables are showing my analysis for risk factors for failing the post-operative voiding trial. And these are patients we consider to be at high risk for urinary retention. Um, they have to be discharged home with a catheter, which um, is uncomfortable for them and inconvenient because they have to come back and have it removed. Of course, um, they are at risk for catheter-associated UTI. Um, a number of reasons why we'd want to identify these people. Um, the table on the left shows my univariate analyses. The red variables uh, were those that I included in my logistic regression model because the p-value was less than 0.1. And I found that using hormone part participants who use systemic hormone replacement therapy um, were at, um, that was an independent predictor for failing the voiding trial. Um, each increasing time that a cystoscopy was performed during the uh, surgery increased the odds for um, failing the voiding trial. And um, the increased operative time, each minute of operative time increased the odds of failing the voiding trial. Interestingly, using an antibiotic regimen other than cefazolin, which was my um, my baseline um, reference group, decreased the risk of failing the voiding trial, which I didn't expect. These tables show my analysis for risk factors of post-operative um, UTI treatment. And as in the last slide, the table on the left shows my univariate analyses, and the red variables were those I included because they were less, the p-value was less than 0.1. And I found that each um, increase each additional time that the patient was catheterized um, increased the odds of postoperative UTI, and each additional ML of blood loss uh, were um, independent predictors of increased odds of UTI. So the implications of my findings. Well, encouragingly, one implication is that my randomization process is working, um, which um, has been reassuring to myself, to me and my mentors. Um, However, um, I've also discovered, and of course, I need to wait until I have full recruitment to um, answer my, my primary question, um, but I've discovered so far, it appears that modifiable risk factors like number of catheterizations and number of cyst cystoscopies um, are important um, uh, outcomes. And I, to my knowledge, this is the first such study in my field that has reported findings like this. Um, some of my um, other findings, especially related to failing the voiding trial and um, uh, risk being modified by hormone replacement therapy use or um, type of um, preoperative antibiotics were, um, were harder for me to explain. And I think that could be because of other confounders that I didn't include. I didn't include an exhaustive list of all the data I've collected for this presentation, but it's certainly given me food for thought as I work towards um, uh, completion and publication of the study. So this concludes my presentation. And again, I thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions or comments.